Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Surge Podcast. My name is Saad Al Zaid, and um, today I figured that uh, I would answer some of the requests I've been getting online. First, thank you for the awesome comments. Um, this is the first one I'll be doing. Uh, it's from Squash Boy eighty nine, and he recently found out that he has his first two blocks in trauma, uh, which he's actually actually excited about. I'd be excited too because trauma is awesome. And he says that he eventually wants to be a trauma surgeon, but he would like to get some pearls on how to set up um, his intern year or, or tips for the intern year. You know, I think it's a very good question. Uh, right off the bat, I'll tell you, uh, intern years are a bit confusing from my perspective uh, for multiple reasons. One of them is that I, I teach postgrad and undergrad, so they're kind of all over the place. And I travel a little bit when I'm teaching. So I see different variations of, of what you would call an intern year. Uh, simply put, I, I would say it depends on what what healthcare system you're used to working in. But there are certain things that you need to have done early, and there are certain potential problems that will occur that the literature seems to report over and over again. And I think that um, that's where I'll start today's episode, which is about surviving your first year of residency, post-grad. Or your intern year. In Kuwait, we call it a trainee year. In the UK, I think they call it a foundation year. My time in Ireland, it was called uh, an intern year. And uh, in Canada and the States, uh, we used to just call it the R1 year, unless you were on a prelim um, spot or, or what they call an integrative year. So there is no clear cut guidebook for how to do this stuff, right? Residency in general is a five-year investment, a 25-year career. And when I say it's a five-year investment, it's a five-year investment. Investments are hard. Ask an investment banker. Investments are extremely hard. They take a burden off of you. What they do is that you, they convert the work that you do into positive yield, right? And so right off the bat, I'd say that there is no clear-cut guidebook for how to do this. But I would thoroughly encourage you to read uh, The House of God by Samuel Shem. It's a bit of an old book now. It was written around about the 60s, 70s. Uh, and it's it's the basis for uh, Scrubs, which is uh, apparently a very good TV show. I've only seen one or two episodes on the plane. But people keep telling me that it's, it's, it is the basis for it, and it's a pretty good TV show. And the reason why I'd read The House of God is because it gives you some insight into the fact that literally we are all in the same boat. And that the internship year or the first year post-grad or your first year of residency will always be tough. There, there's no easy way to navigate it. Residency in general is like that, right? It's it's not an easy thing. And it's not a science. It's it's It's... It's more of a mentorship, um, apprenticeship type of situation. And, and those are hard because the structure is a little bit different. But tips for the first day. So first thing you should do on your first day is, number one, start your day a day earlier. So what I mean by that is get to know your patients early. Okay. Arrive a day earlier, get in contact with the intern who's on. When If you know where, which ward you'll be working in, give the other intern who's on a call, the guy who's rotating on there before you. If it's your first block, then that means that they've just finished their residency chances or their internship chances are. Give them a call. Uh, ask them how the ward is run, what protocols are available, what you should read, what the most common problems are. Get to know the service. Get to know some of the patients on the service. Just so that you have some idea and you begin your orientation process just 24 hours earlier, right? Once you start your first official day, so you pre-round the day before, but your first official day, make sure that you get to speak to some of the nurses, introduce yourself to them, introduce yourself to your physiotherapists, your pharmacists, your team effectively on that ward. Make sure that everybody knows you and they know that they can get, get in contact with you and that you are available. This is essential for the rest of your medical career. If you want to be good to your patients, your team has to have the confidence to be able to talk to you about anything and everything that they feel is prudent for you. Okay? Introduce yourself to your seniors. Try and figure out what's expected of you and then get started. Okay? 
Your first week, however, is a bit more challenging. So the first week will always be challenging because it includes the first call. Uh, I personally like to take call early on the service, preferably my first day on the service. I, I plan to take call. And if I have any control over the schedule, I try and take call. It's because if it's an active call and it's very busy, then you'll learn very quickly. And if it's an inactive call and it's slow, then you'll get to know the patients and it'll give you enough time to learn how the system works, uh, how the ward works, get to know people on the ward, right? You're there anyways. So that's your first week. You should get your first call done early. But you should also try and figure out what your goals should be from the rotation and refine them. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on, but that would be another thing that you'd have to take care of on the first week. Another essential part is the consult. So I've had the most intelligent, medal-winning, Olympic-level graduates, people who would floor me at anything I gave them. I mean, I would be like, holy shit, man. These people are insane. She's like the robocop of echocardiography. Like, she will not only do the echoes better than I can in the ICU, but she knows every single abnormality that she's supposed to be seeing. She gets the picture even on the, that huge patient with the hyperinflated lungs. I'm like, I'm not impressed. I'm ashamed of my own skill, right? But when she comes down to writing the consults, every now and then you get this one intern. When he or she comes down to writing the consults, they write an excellent review, an excellent differential diagnosis, excellent history of physical exam and summary. It's beautiful. And it's typed up perfect on the system, and it's in the right places on the system. But it's so much writing that their thought process gets lost in the middle. Now, if I get to have a one-to-one -one conversation with them, I'm fine with it. But if I don't, then, then I feel that whoever's reading that consultation, if she's writing it for my service, or he's writing it for my service, and unfortunately I'm talking about somebody specific, but she's gotten much better over the past 10 years, I'm that old. <laughs> um, it, it, I know that she knows the stuff, but I also know that she likes to be very uh, clear in, in, in what he or she writes. Um, the, the, the advice that I would give you is you can be very thorough, but make sure that your impression and plan is on the first page of your consult and is clearly highlighted. And make sure that your impression reflects your own thoughts and your plan reflects what you want to do. So for example, anemia for investigation. It could be hemorrhagic shock. It could be iron deficiency anemia. It could be malignancy. It could be uh, malnutrition. It could be a metabolic problem. It could be a hemolytic problem. You don't know, right? And you would be absolutely right in listing those differentials. But if the same patient has recently had something like a huge overburdening tumor of the cecum that was diagnosed on CT scan for a bowel obstruction, chances are it's anemia secondary to malignancy, especially if there are liver metastases and metastases all over the place. And so in your impression, you should document that, that you feel that it's most likely to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it's less likely to be 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. In fact, when radiologists do this for me, and they know this, those of you who are listening, uh, Mustafa Sultan, uh, my brother from another mother, if you write what you think is most likely and what you think is least likely, it's like you're giving me a GPS. And when you write your plan based on a clear-cut definition, which we'll go through in a second, every day, not just the consults, but every day in your continuation notes and in your admission notes, it also makes it easy for me to follow your train of thought. And this goes both ways. This goes both in terms of writing the consults themselves, making sure that you have a clear impression of what you think and a plan, and the other way around. When you call cardiology for something, letting them know what your impression is and what you expect their plan would be, and having a discussion before they show up so that you have some of the tests already ordered, makes everybody happy. Quick example is a patient comes in, EKG changes, looks like fast AFib, but you're not sure. Uh, you do a uh, EKG, it confirms the fast AFib, you're in the ICU, so you decide to bolus amiodarone. Um, your fellow who's on with you tells you to call cardiology just in case there's something missing because the patient really shouldn't have AFib right now. The electrolytes are fine. 
a uh, patient just has a very mild pneumonia, but was intubated because he's COPD or but his ejection fraction is okay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you notice that there's a bit of a trope leak, whatever reason. When you call the cardiologist and you say, I have a guy in AFib, I'm bolusing a mammal right now, he's in the ICU, I'm not sure what's going on, and my fellow would like to get your opinion. Is there anything else you'd like me to order? The cardiologist will love it because he'll say, fine, order a BMP or order a second set of tropes and another EKG, I'll be right there to see it. Or send me a picture of the EKG on the system, right? So our EMR has that thing going on where I can take pictures and put them up on the system. They usually put it in for dermatology, but I'm, I'm not assuming that you have it. I'm assuming that there's a way that you can do this that's HIPAA compliant. When you do do stuff like that, it makes the report easier, and you will be remembered as that helpful guy. So when you call, people will show up. When orthopedics are called uh, for a uh, open leg fracture and you're already st setting up the antibiotics, you've gotten an x-ray to make sure that the rest of the joints are fine and it's only that isolated open fracture, you've gotten vascular to clear the leg or you've cleared it yourself because you were smart enough to do ABIs and you've done everything and you're just telling them, listen, I need you here for the leg, they'll show up in 10 seconds, right? It's that type of thing. Now, in terms of the orders and the plan, so... In all plans to do with pseudo-surgical or surgical patients, or patients in general, I tend to follow this pattern, and I think it makes sense for everybody so you don't miss anything. The drugs, what to do about the drains, are they on suction, aren't they on suction, how much suction, when they should call you, what output should they call you for for the drain, the activity of the patient, is the activity as tolerated, partial weight bearing or not, the vital signs. And sent to spirometry and physiotherapy, DVT prophylaxis, and the type that you want to give in duration, any investigations you'd like them to do, and the patient's diet and nutrition as well. When you write these things down in that order, it looks systematic and it's easy to follow, especially if you have a soap included, and these are admission orders, it's just modifications at the plan, right? Now, as much as I'd like this to be a mnemonic, it just doesn't make sense to me to call it uh, David Double D's I. That, that, that doesn't make sense. Or David I Double D's. Like, I don't know. If that works for you, then it works for you. But drugs, activity, vitals, incentive spirometry, DVT prophylaxis, uh, drains, diet, uh, and investigations. If you have those down on your plan, you're already going a long ways away. Now, what about potential problems throughout the year and throughout your residency? So there's a whole bunch of data on the problems that you can have. Some of this data comes from studies. Some of this data comes from uh, people having open discussions. And some of this data comes from reports. But here's a gist of what you have uh, to look forward to, um, Squash Boy. Number one feelings that you're unprepared or being unprepared for a rotation. So showing up on your vascular rotation, not knowing what the hell the investigations are that they order. Number two, balancing uh, work, family, and friends. Number three, uh, what things you should avoid doing during your residency in general. Number four, handling failure when you fuck up. Number five, accepting feedback and what feedback you can ignore. Number six, abuse and conflict. Number seven, support systems and how they work and how you can support each other. Number eight, moving forward. Number nine, the learning curve. Nine. Yep, they were nine. The learning curve involved and how to beat a steep learning curve. So number one, being unprepared. So we are, I still know nothing about neurosurgery. Quick confession here. Right? I know how to put in an EVD, I know how to do a crany, but I don't really understand neurosurgery. Like I don't, uh, glioblastoma multiformes, I can't see them on an MRI. I know that there's something that's wrong on the MRI, I don't know what it is, right? But when I was on my neurosurgical rotation, a week to two weeks beforehand, I picked out two journal articles to do with neurotrauma that I knew I was going to do if they asked me for a journal club. And I looked up the top 10 things that they constantly talked about on their ward. So I asked the nurses. I went there a day, like a week or two before. 
got to know some of the nurses and asked around what the most common things were. Strokes, hemorrhagic strokes, CVAs, whatever, endovascular stuff, uh, vascular base of skull stuff. And then I would read around those topics for about two weeks beforehand just to get an idea. And like I said, 24 hours earlier, I'd introduce myself to the team and get to know the patients. I still do this now when I'm coming on service in the ICU, to be honest. Like, I'll show up, just take a look at the files, take a look at the patients, just just to get myself ready so that I'm ahead of the game on my first day. The first hour is done of the day, right? So I would contend that reading around the topics about two weeks ahead of time, picking out two articles that you should know, and then setting up yourself so that you cover at least one call as early as possible during the rotation, all help you out a lot because it'll help you to acclimatize and be prepared for the rotation. Now, family and friends, very important, but very difficult. So I was lucky in that I did both my medical school and my residency without my family being around. I say that I'm lucky because it's a bigger burden, in my opinion, for them not to see you, but have you in the same town. So what I used to do was back in the day, um, it was either phone calls or emails. And emails worked better for me because um, I didn't have the time during the first couple of years of my residency. Nowadays, I would say that WhatsApp and things like that can help out a lot. Keeping track of each other on Instagram and having regular uh, teleconference meetings. So we used to always do FaceTime, but, you know, uh, up to and including my cousins, like the extensions of my family. But you can also probably uh, end up doing Zoom meetings. I think that that's what we're doing today for these things, right? In terms of friends... So I, I think that having friends outside of uh, medicine is very healthy and very important. And the reason why is because they're, they're the rock that you're going to have available to you when the medical people just don't get it. And when you feel intimidated uh, or you feel that, certainly for me, listen, I, I did a residency in surgery. So in surgery, there's a lot of tough guy mentality around. And so uh, it was easier for me to talk to people outside of the surgical realm when I felt vulnerable and when I felt that I was, you know, having a bad day. Um, talking to people outside that realm uh, helped me out a lot. And the way that I made friends, because I kept moving from one place to another, was uh, to basically pick a hobby that I liked and meet people through it. I wouldn't suggest that you do this because it can be a little bit potentially painful and possibly career-ending. But I do a lot of jujitsu, and I still do it now. And what I found is wherever I go, I'll find a jujitsu gym, uh, join it, and then I get to know people there. So uh, in Montreal, I had a great gym, a bunch of great guys. Some of them were extremely, extremely good at jujitsu. Some of them not so good. And just having that base of people that you can talk to outside of the medical field so that you have that support system and you have people you can talk to that that are going to look at the situation for you and discuss it for you and without making you feel too vulnerable is extremely important it also meant that i had some time to decompress outside of the medical field never events so things that you should never do with me never ever 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 talk down to somebody in front of me even if you're angry it's okay for me personally i don't think it's right but it's okay to lose your shit every now and then all right uh it's okay to swear a little bit i guess but don't call somebody a fucking idiot in front of me never uh treat your nurses with disrespect because they put up with the nurses sh with the, the other nurses shit number one because nurses give each other attitude all the time you don't know this as a physician but the nurses they're listening to this can attest i can guarantee you Having had some nursing background myself, nurses give each other shit all the time. They give each other a hard time all the time, right? Uh, the uh, PABs are giving them shit. Uh, the physiotherapists are giving them shit. And the patients are giving them shit. You're not allowed to give them shit. You're allowed to give them some suggestions in the chart that they know to follow anyway. And you know why? It's because you're an R1 and you're an intern. And before you showed up, the service was running. And after you show up, the service will be running. We would very much like it if you could be part of that service. And if you could be a helping hand in that service. But when you shout at nurses or shout at your colleagues or lose your shit or, or treat other residents with disrespect, other medical students with disrespect, that to me is an every event, especially as an intern.
right? Especially as an intern. I, I, I know that you guys are sharp. I know that you probably know more than I do about reading EKGs at this point. But I can guarantee you that that EKG that you don't know how to read, I'll know how to read. And for me to have the time to be able to do that, I need you to support me and be nice to people around me so that my service runs well. That's never event number one. Never event number two, do not lie to me. Never event number three, you can slack off on certain things, but do not slack off when it comes to patient care. Whenever you have a conflict of interest, the patient's interests come first. So long as you put the patient first, I will defend you 100%. This is my personal perspective, but it's also the ethical perspective. All right. These three things are probably the biggest never events. Don't lie. Put the patient first. Don't slack off if the patient needs something done. And never treat anybody like shit in front of me. Handling failure. So doing these three things is a very, very bad thing. right? And I won't even mention the evaluation. I'll give you feedback that's very clear about it. And the feedback will be tattooed in your mindset forever. right? Uh, for you guys who are listening, who've worked with me on trauma in Kuwait, you all know what I'm talking about. Moving on, handling failure. So I will never be angry at you for failing, even if it's a technical problem, even if it's the most horrendous complication ever. It's because we've all been through it. Other people make it sound like uh, they've never seen anything like this, and it's the weirdest thing ever, but we've all been through it. I've seen my colleagues berate and destroy people. I talked about it during the chest tube talk. I'll talk about it some more some other time, but I'll never do this to you because I know that we've all been through it. What I do want you to do is I want you to embrace what I call embrace the, the, the suck. You know, embrace the fact that shit sucks, right? Embrace that. Get to understand why you fucked up, how you fucked up, and how you're going to improve. The way that you do that is you should talk to the people who were around you when the fuck up happened. Uh, example is unable to intubate. Example is unable to call a surgical airway. Example is unable to uh, put in the chest tube or putting in the chest tube in the wrong area like we talked about in previous episodes. Figure out what went wrong and why it went wrong. Ask people who are more senior than you. Ask people who are more junior than you. Ask people to the left of you and to the right of you. And figure out where the mistake happened. Is it a knowledge problem? Is it a technical problem? Is it a patient-related factor? Even if it is a patient-related factor, try and improve upon it. That's the way that I would handle failure from a technical aspect. From an emotional aspect, go back to your friends. Listen, uh, the guys who I, I, I spent time with in, in Montreal um, at TriStar, um, they were like my rock, man. Um, whenever I felt like shit, they knew it. Because jujitsu is one of those contact sports where you can read somebody very easily. And they were all very approachable. And uh, I tried to do the same thing and reciprocate, right? So find that support system that we'll talk about in a sec to help you out with that too. It's the toughest thing ever. You know, nobody will ever know the grief that somebody feels when they failed a patient. Nobody will ever know it. Unless you've worked in the medical profession, nobody will ever know what it's like to do your best and have a very bad outcome. Have somebody not make it through and leave the hospital, despite you doing everything correctly, right? Nobody will ever know this, but but people working in our profession. I'm talking about the doctors, the nurses, the first responders, the EMSs, the physiotherapists. Nobody knows what it's like to get to know somebody and then watch things go badly, despite your best efforts, despite everything being done 100% by the book. And so that's why I tell you that you have to analyze it and you have to digest it and you have to figure out why things happen, if you can. And then you have to process it for yourself. For me, that's been my form of closure in these situations. Bringing us to feedback. So feedback is a very finicky thing. There's good feedback, there's bad feedback, and there's things that you can never fix because it's your personality. right? So everybody knows who know, who's worked with me knows that I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. Right? I'm an intensivist with a surgical background, and we tend to have a stereotype, especially when we're trauma surgeons. But the way I looked at feedback was like this. There are certain things that I know I'm going to be good at. And there are certain things that I need to work on. For the things that I need to work on, 
some of them I will pick up on on myself. Listen, uh, the first time you take a couple of stitches, you, you're very proud of the fact that you actually got through the stitches, but you know that they're not perfect, right? Stitches on skin and they're not perfect. Or you put down those skin clips, they're not perfect. But then you have a plan to improve upon that. Make sure that you address all aspects of your feedback in that manner. So if somebody tells you that you, you have a problem communicating certain issues overnight in a clear, succinct fashion, make sure that it's clear that that, that needs to be done correctly, right? And that, that you have a plan for that. That you're going to figure out why you couldn't communicate effectively overnight to your senior and your senior had to come to look at everything. Uh, and then, you know, all these things. If you get feedback that there's a, a person who did not appreciate a comment that you made, something like saying, holy shit, that's retarded. Figure out why. M maybe it's because you shouldn't be calling uh, things retarded and people retarded. Maybe that might be something. Maybe you should apologize. Address it, right? That would be my take on feedback. Every now and then you get what I call unhealthy feedback. Every now and then you get a senior registrar or a senior resident or a junior attending you know, who just loses their shit and says things that are completely inappropriate to you that do not make sense to you, right? When you have a goal and they have a goal and it's opposing, it's called a conflict. When the conflict cannot be resolved amicably, it's called abuse, bringing us to our next topic, how to handle abuse and conflict. So my personal takeaway on this is as follows. If somebody comes up to me Listen, gossip in medicine is not abuse. People gossiping behind your back, saying that you, you don't know what you're doing, saying uh, completely inappropriate things like, you, you're an idiot, you're retarded, oh, that guy's an idiot, oh, that guy's a fucking disaster. People saying that behind your back, you can't control for that. That's not abuse. That's just people being inappropriate. Okay? That creates an abusive environment. But you can never say that that person abused you to your face, right? And you can't let that gossip be something that you take to heart when you're not taking positive feedback and negative feedback to heart. That's my opinion, right? And that's why I put these two next to each other. So if somebody comes up to you and gives you shit to your face that doesn't make sense to you, whether it's unhealthy feedback, like you're a fucking idiot, or uh, whether it's... Um, an unhealthy manner of addressing you in rounds. Hey, idiot, come over here. Hey, lemming, come over here. You know, that's a problem, right? And the way I tend to take care of it is as follows. So I walk up to the person in a very quiet environment and I tell them the truth, that they do not need to call me an idiot, uh, that they don't need to call me a fucking idiot, that they don't need to call me a turnip. They can just call me by my first name. And, you know, they will say, oh, yeah, no, I was just joking. And then you say, well, if that's the case, then, you know, I think that you should get to know me a little bit better before you start joking around. And maybe we can do it outside of patients' rooms. And maybe, uh, you know, next time around, uh, we can try and keep it to a minimum because I really do think that you're not using the same language with other people. You make it very clear that, that you notice that this guy's talking to, or this person's talking to you in a shitty ass manner and that they're being shitheads without calling them shitheads. You be the bigger person. Now, obviously, I've been through this as a junior resident. Uh, you can clearly tell. And I did not call that person a shithead, but I made it very clear to them that they were shitheads. The more you do this and the more you practice it, the better you get at it. And I'm going to give a whole talk on conflict and abuse a little bit later on, I think. I'm preparing it right now, but that's my two cents on it. Personally, me, I give feedback privately, then I give feedback to the whole team as a whole. And then I accept feedback as well. And I do that with everybody I work with, right? And I do it about once a month, but that's just me. Now, how to build a support system. So my whole support system centers around academic half day, at least in our program. So when I say support system, so we already talked about how your friends are going to support you outside of work. I mean, people are going to support you at work. Two rules. First is have lunch together before and after your academic days. Have at least one meal with your brethren, 
with with your tribe, with the group that you're going to be living with for the next five years. Number two, be available. So when I say be available, be available to cover call because that just means that you'll get more exposure. Be available to dog sit. All right. I still love my neighbor's dog. Whenever she took calls, she was this ridiculously amazing cardiac surgeon, freaking machine. I used to take care of that dog. Walk the dog, anything with the dog. Sometimes for two or three days when she had like a marathon run. Because, listen, general surgery, R3, R4, home call most of the time. You get called in to do a major case and you come back. The dog is not going to miss you for an hour as long as you put something good on the TV, right? But I still miss that dog. And I miss being that support system. And I'm, to be honest with you, I miss those guys and I would do anything for them to this day. And I know that they have my back because I was available for them and it was an unwritten rule that they were available for me. Having lunch and dinner together means that your mindset is the same. At least one meal a week with people from your own residency program. Even if you're shy, just push yourself towards it. Not even a full meal. Fine. Hockey game and beer. Doesn't matter. Something. A couple of drinks, chicken wings, pizza, something. Just, just one interaction. I also used to have team dinners. And the reason why I did team dinners was because I quickly called on to the fact that if we had dinner as a team at the end of our rotation, the next rotation that we have, we've already bonded outside of work. And so that, that allegiance and that support system grows within the team itself. And it's amazing when you see it, right? Now I'm seeing my residents do the same thing without me actually telling them. And it's amazing to see how, how they interact on their own. They have their own support system, their own niches. And I'm okay with not being part of that. And I'm okay with seeing it because it tells me that there's something organic about the way it works. It's almost tribal. That's why I keep calling it a tribe, right? But have that support system. Because these are the guys that are going to have your back when you're organizing your wedding. Because you need them to cover the call schedule for you. These are the guys that are going to have your back when um, you need them to go pick shit up at the airport. Because you can't make it down there. And they lost your luggage again. And you have to take call the first day back from Kuwait. Literally from Kuwait, like a freaking 18-hour flight, you know? These are the guys that will have your back when you forget your passport on the way to Kuwait. Tal uh, Gaud, I owe you my life. You know, this shit, it's priceless. And to build that, you need to invest some time and you need to be available. How do you maintain momentum moving forward? So what I mean by moving forward is how do you maintain momentum? How, how do you push yourself to get better week on week, month on month, year on year, rotation on rotation? So do you remember the topics that I told you about rotations? So similar concept. So write down five things that you want to learn in every rotation. Sorry, write down 25 things that you want to learn out of every rotation or every discipline that you have within your field. So for example, 25 things that I want to learn from the oncology service. Number one, staging and grading for breast cancer. Number two, mastectomies, differences between them. Number three, uh, sentinel lymph node biopsies how to do them, when to do them, and whether or not I should get auxiliary lymph node clearances. Number four, uh, synchronous metastatic disease, when to perform a resection of the liver and the colon at the same time. Uh, you get the point, right? Have 25 of these little topics that you need to learn and you think that you need to be good at. It could be at your stage something as simple as how to put a central line in, how to put an NG tube in, how to intubate. Uh, top five ventilator modes, how to set up a ventilator on my own, how to service it regulated, and uh, basics of dialysis, and classification systems for organ failure. It could be something like that. But have 25 of them listed, squeeze your brain out, and then pick the top five that you need to learn the most and work on them first. I've always read, ever since I was in high school, I've read for an hour in the morning before I go to school and an hour at night before I go to bed. And I usually dedicate one hour to the topic that I'm learning specifically or I have a problem with. And a second hour was preparation for exams. So it would be something like, um, or sorry, a topic like that I'm interested in. So I might read, so right now I'm reading a book on um, healthcare informatics and complex systems, right? So I'll read that for an hour in the morning on my phone typically because ebooks rock. And then I, I would read for another hour at night on something that I'm trying to get better at and something that I'm preparing for. For example, right now I'm preparing for an ECMO certification, so I'm reading about that right now. 
And then as exams came on, I would stretch out the hours so that it becomes two hours a day, it becomes four hours a day, it becomes six hours a day, it becomes eight hours a day, until I can set up a whole continuum. And that's how I maintain my momentum. Learning curves. So learning curves are shit in surgery, right? They kill you. There are certain things that you don't even like get to perfect during residency. When I say certain things, I mean like 60% of what you do, you will not perfect during residency, my friend. Sad truth if you're doing a, a surgical residency. So uh, it's a bit of a problem, right? Here's my advice on this. Embrace the fact that you don't know and work at it. And ask for help early. So I was really shit at laparoscopy when I started. When I say really shit, I mean until I was in R2, I was slow at lap coles. They confused me. So I asked friends how the fuck they were good. And they told me what they did. And I realized that it just means that I have to do it a lot more than they did. So I asked a couple of my friends. And what they said was they'd use the box trainer once a week. So that meant I was using it every single day. And that would be my investment for that hour. And that they watched lots of YouTube videos. So that meant that I was going to watch YouTube videos every night of uh, lap coles. And so I did that for about six weeks. And by week number seven, uh, I was doing lap coles just as fast as the R4s were. And that worked out for me. And since then, I realized that it's, it's, it's about myelination. It's about consciously thinking about the problem, the general principle behind it, developing the correct tactics, and then applying them. Uh, you know, I, I think that's, that's sort of the realm of surgery that we need to explore next. It's how do we effectively teach it. And medicine in general, but surgery too, and trauma, it's how do we teach it effectively, right? And that's how I'd beat the learning curve. Burnout. So here's the sad reality. Burnout happens more in your junior years than your senior years. People tend to link it to working hours, but what we found is that even with reduced working hours, burnout still happens. We've made accusations, some of them unfounded, that it's because we don't declare all the working hours. Chances are that we do. My personal belief is burnout is related to purpose. So long as you have a sense of purpose, your rate of burnout will be lower. And so long as you are prepared, you keep in touch with your family and friends and have a good system of friends outside of work, you respect everybody that you work with, you have a healthy attitude towards handling failure and you process it well, you accept feedback when it's warranted, and know how to deal with abuse and conflict through official and non-official channels that are amicable. You develop a support system and be there for your colleagues. You learn how to move forward and maintain momentum throughout your residency. And you develop a learning curve. And accept the fact that it's going to be a tough learning curve. Your chances of burning out are very low. But when it does happen, listen to your friends. So it happens to me every once in a while. Especially when I do things like crazy shit like... 45 days of trauma call. Listen to your friends. Your friends will tell you to take a day off. Just listen to them, all right? Because they are your yardstick. They're your litmus test. They know you. They will tell you. Like recently, a very good friend of mine told me, listen, man, um, you sound tired over the phone. Get some sleep. You just don't sound right. And he was right. So uh, I asked a friend to cover me for about six hours. Went to bed. Woke up the next morning bright and early and I felt 100% better I was performing better and I realized what I was doing what I wasn't doing well and so that's why I think it's very important that you address it early and that you rely on your friends to tell you when you're not quite right good luck thanks for the quest squash boy it was great preparing this talk uh, sorry if it took a little bit longer than I, uh, I was planning uh, I did ramble a little bit I, I did realize that now in retrospect but uh, thank you uh, for the great kind comments. Um, have fun on that run while you're listening to this squash boy. And please keep the comments and the requests coming. This is Saud Al Zaid. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe and have a good day.